Well, gentlemen, good to see you on a, another Thursday evening here uh, with our Zoom meet. And uh, I don't have any announcements tonight, uh, but probably by the next one, we'll be speaking a little bit more about what's happening in October over Charlie Taylor's place. Uh, anybody have anything they want to share announcement wise? Okay, then I would like to turn this over to our featured speaker, Mr. Sebula. DC, the floor is yours. Okay. Let's go here. And we'll start from the beginning. Okay. You can all see. Everybody can see that? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so Roger hit my my blog and uh, nominated me to do this uh, presentation this evening. So on a ventilated boxcar conversion that I did. So um, why build a ventilated boxcar? Um, this image is of Wyoming, Delaware, though it's uh, post-Civil War. What you see there is boxcars and boxcars on uh, men unloading peaches. Okay, uh, so peaches were a major export uh, commercial crap cash crop of uh, from Delaware in the mid centuries to about 1900. Uh, Growing peaches in Delaware, this is just a brief history. Growing peaches in Delaware began in Delaware in 1832 uh, around Delaware City, which is the eastern terminus of the uh, Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. Uh, and it spread south from there. And interestingly, interestingly enough, it spread along the route as the railroad went south, so did the peach industry. Um, and that was beginning about 1850. Uh, Delaware was actually, sorry, LeBron, but Delaware was actually the first state to uh, export peach, peaches as a cash crop. Uh, you've heard of cotton plantations and you've heard of uh, um, Tobacco plantations. Well, in Delaware, they also had peach plantations. As a matter of fact, in 1863, the business was so good that farmers banded together and they sued the Delaware Railroad because there weren't enough cars to transport peaches to market. Okay. Uh, by 1875, uh, there were 900 thousand boxcars of peaches exported and that's about five million baskets bushel baskets of peaches and by 1895 there were 800,000 plus peach trees in Delaware. As a matter of fact on May 9th of 19 uh, sorry 1895 uh the assembly uh, down in Dover, Delaware, made the peach blossom the Delaware state flower. Okay, so peaches were very important commodity, and I would be very remiss not to have a few of these ventilated box cars on uh, my layout. Uh, unfortunately, about 1900, uh, an epidemic spread throughout the peach orchards, um, which was called the peach yellows. It was, there was no known cure at the time. It was carried by aphids. And many orchards were completely destroyed and farmers uh, turned to other cash crops, such as apples, watermelons, and even pumpkins, okay? Uh, so today, there are only three major peach orchards left in Delaware, a mere shadow of what it is. But if you go driving down in rural Delaware, you can see a lot of the mansions that were built from the profits of the peach industry. 
As a matter of fact, each uh, in August, uh, Middletown, Delaware holds a peach festival. And not to be outdone, those cars that are sometimes people would call them watermelon cars, they were then, after the peaches passed, were used to transport things like the apples and uh, watermelons. So some of the cars are known as watermelon cars. They also transported pumpkins. As a matter of fact, in addition to the Peach Pet Festival, Delaware holds an annual event called uh, Pumpkin Chunking, which some of you may have been uh, heard of. And basically people develop different machines to see how far you can throw a pumpkin. So anyways, to get specifics in terms of the modeling, uh, this is the car that I used um, by IHC. AHM had similar cars, uh, ventilated box car. It's not a horse car, and it's not really a uh, um, a present car, as some people have, have labeled. It was a ventilated box car designed originally in Delaware to transport uh, peaches. And uh, this is what I will be turning the car into during the course of this presentation. Question. Okay. Yes, sir. So are you saying this was this was post Civil War? No, no, no. The peaches industry began in eighteen. No, no, the car. The car. The, the original car, the uh, IHC car, is post Civil War. I got it. Okay. And that's because it's too long, too tall, too wide. Okay. Um, but to turn it that one car into this car, I went back to that old uh, model railroader article and based it uh, my conversion using this as a uh, something to emulate. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, just uh, one caveat I want to mention, when I use the term HO scale one by two or two by four, uh, it can also be uh, 0 0.010 by 0 0.020 or 0 0.20 by 0 0.40. The measurements aren't exact, but they're close enough for our purposes and for modeling. From my perspective, at least. Uh, let's see. That was the first page. Okay. To do the conversion, I rely, oops, let's see, let's go back here. You read the original one, and I was kind of unhappy with some aspects of it. Things I don't like are uh, cast on, you can see the cursor, the cast on uh, grab irons. Uh, the end sill is not prototypical for our time period. The way that the uh, bodies attached to the floor is kind of atrocious. Um, look at the other end, it has the same problems, the really nice horn hook coupler, and that uh, brake wheel is not a period brake wheel. And you could just kind of love the chain that comes down here to this metal plate and you just wonder how they actually do stop the cars without the, uh, it actually going underneath to where the brakes are. So um, the underside here, you have those nice six inch thick uh, truss rods. Um, so the car is kind of overscale. It's a real, it's a neat car, but it's toy like and it's post Civil War. I'm trying to do something backdated so it looks prototypical for the Civil War era as something that could have been run by some of the earlier Delaware railroads. Uh, the tools I used were basically as down here below, you've got my HO scale rule. If you do other scales, you can also do O scale and scale using the same ruler and um, this divider. As uh, Stuart, I haven't been able to find another one. Unfortunately, over the years, I've dropped it. And so the points aren't quite as exact as I would have liked them to be. But those tools I find invaluable in uh, modeling. The first step, of course, is to assemble the car. 
And for that, I used a flathead screwdriver and X-Acto knife. Uh, there's all the parts and uh, take, take the car weights out. And uh, of course, I always bag up the uh, parts that I've taken off simply because I tend to lose things if I don't do that. Um, next step, I took a razor saw and I basically cut the car. And since this was the first time I ever did something like that, you can see here where the cuts in from the side. And eventually uh, I decided not to use the end pieces or the roof, but I took the size. And what I did, I then took a razor saw and I cut the grab bars off the left side and the equal amount of car off the right side. Now, if I were, if these were solid sides and I was building a box car, I could have just cut out the center section. But since this was going to have a see-through door, I cut out four boards uh, from the left side of the opening and four boards from the right side of the opening. So this is what they're going to be looking like at this point. Um, I butt glued the ends together. What I did is I would, I don't have a picture of it, but I put a straight edge down the bottom to keep at this point having the uniform bottom edge was important because I will be cutting parts off the top. That was not as important. The holes here I filled with, I believe it was 1 16th inch styrene rod, evergreen styrene rod. Uh, and then green puttied it. Uh, when everything was dried, I sanded it smooth. I also sanded the uh, cast on door stops. And then I would take the back edge of a uh, exacto knife and I rescribed those lines. Okay. And let's see, what slide am I on? Uh, Okay. okay, after that, then I, uh, these were uh, one by four uh, styrene strip just put on to kind of show you the idea. I used them, I just tacked them on lightly, and then I cut everything off above the styrene strip, which gave me plenty of room to put on a door, upper door guide and uh, for the doors I will use eventually. Okay, um, next we go to this is uh, how it looks once it was glued together. Now, this strip that's going at these strips, I should say, going across the door opening, there it's actually placed so that the bracing on the door covers it up. I was worried that you could see it, but once you paint it black or dark gray, it all but disappears inside the car. You don't notice that it's there. Okay. But before I got to that point, I had to uh, redo the ends. Uh, these are some jigs that I've used. These particular ones are designed for a uh, converting a man to a box car to an arch roof box car. Uh, the one on the left is metal, and of course, the one on the right is just the uh, um, styrene. Um, and I also, what, what's down here, I might as well, before I got my chopper, uh, Northwest Short Line chopper, I made this and I lay a piece of one, or no, two by two styrene in there, and then use a razor blade and just cut off little sections to make my nut and bolt and washer fastings that I was going to use. Um, this is what the car and looks like. This is the AN. Um, the end beam is made out of a uh, HO scale six by six. Before gluing it in, I actually took a razor slaw, saw and you drag it. Uh, the blade along, this is an original with me, the, the styrene, and you do it on the top, the bottom. I even did top the side, even the bottom, uh, which was probably unnecessary. 
And I also did the same thing with the razor saw before I glued them together this way on the sides. And uh, that simulates the wood grain. And then you just took a little bit of fine grain sandpaper after that to kind of smooth any burrs off. As you can see down in here, this still has a little burr on it. Uh, okay. When I'm cutting the end beams here, I always cut them slightly longer, you know, probably less than a 16th inch on either end. And once the glue is dried, then I take, uh, in my case, a, a nail emery board, nail file, and send it, sand the end smooth with the car sides. Okay. Um, otherwise, that's the way I get it so it's nice and centered and even with what's going to happen next. For the bracing, I probably did not need uh, to use bracing at this, this thick. Butt joints are notoriously weak, and I did want to strengthen them, so that's what I did. You'll notice how on the end here, I how I reversed the uh, the original um, boxcar end. Now to attach the floors to the car body, I actually run a screw through the a coupler, through the floor, and into the pieces like here. And that's what holds my cars together. And then the truss rods, like they do in the originals, tend to hold everything nice and square and level. Um, let's see. This car, well, that's just another view from the top down. Um, this is a different car, but I wanted to focus on the uh, uh, lateral truss washers here. Um, basically, I made them out of HO scale uh, one by four, okay. which I uh, cut to the dimensions. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but what I would do is um, based on the, uh, the drawing, so they would match that. And then the nuts here are actually uh, two by two, that two by two styrene that I cut with the nut cutter. I stand one end so it's smooth, it's nice and perpendicular. And I glue that into the car as I did with the sides. They're a little bit longer. And uh, oops, let's go back to the other one. And then I have a piece of styrene to the correct thickness. And I just place the styrene in like in this area and use my file to sand it smooth so that this uh, nut bolt and washer casting is the same as this one, is the same on the ones on either side, is the same on any card that I build. Okay. And uh, this is the braking. This again is from the drawing. And this is what I'm using for my model of the brake end. And uh, again, this is not the car that I built, but a different car. Uh, I wanted to talk about this is probably going to be the longest slide that I talk about. Um, let's see. Um, break, break in details. Okay, again, note, note the simulated wood grain in the beams. Um, the bumper blocks here were also made by uh, uh, HO scale six by six or evergreen 0 0.06 by 0 0.06 styrene. I set my uh, divider to the dimension from the end to this side. And I do that for both so that these are both centered on the, on the end sill and they are where they're supposed to be on every car. Uh, Let's see. Um, I made on the original 
car here and on the photos you see of US military railroad box cars, the, these washers are actually oval in shape. Mm. They're, they're, they're different from those. So I've made a no go, no go jig. And what I simply do is take a tweezers and hold a piece of one by four styrene and uh, in the tweezers and gently round off the edge. Okay. And so to look eventually, you know, it was just trial and error. Just sand a little, look how it fit, sand a little more, look how it fit. Uh, when I was happy with at one end, I would cut it short and then do the end to the other end till it fit through the jig. Then you glue the oval washers again using the divider to make sure they're equidistant from each end and glue them on. And then the nuts that you see here are again, are the two by twos, styrenes that I glued on. And then I also sanded them just like I did on the sides. Now these nut and bolt washer castings are uh, Titchy train number 8016. And to drill them, uh, I drilled uh, number 77 holes to put them in, which is maybe a little bit loose, but they fit, go in pretty nicely. And then with just a drop of uh, uh, styrene cement, they just never had a problem with them. Okay. One of the biggest things is making a brake platform here. Now the brake platform you see here is from a Titchy train part, uh, let's see, number 3003. Um, I, I've since modified, but um, the, car, the car that I'm talking about, this is what I use. Uh, I have a couple more jigs I made. The first one I can just rest on the platform here and it rests at the bottom of the, uh, the brake platform. The brake platform itself is made out of HO scale uh, two by 10, cut 24 inches long, scale inches long, okay? Uh, now what I actually do is I have a piece of one by two inch scale lumber that I put up there and it makes me uh, holding this platform perpendicular to the body. It makes it a little easier and actually strengthens the joint. Okay, then I take that jig away and I use another jig, which is the same as the distance from here to here. I do not have pictures of those jigs. However, it allows me to place these pieces on any card I build the same distance from the end beam. Okay. And those are just little rectangular pieces about an X scale six inches long. Okay. And they're inset from the ends, the equivalent of an HO scale. Uh, about two, three inches. The measurement's never quite exact when I'm doing these other than they need to be lined up perfectly. So I glue those on. On top here, I glue on some HO scale one by two by four inches. And after they're done, this is actually comes out to be about an HO scale 12 inches. Mm -hmm. I cut them a little long, I sand them to fit, and they just fit in there between this piece and the back of this piece, little styrene cement, and uh, you'll think they're just one piece, okay? Uh, they're actually quite strong, and I've really rough housed them uh, a lot of times, and uh, you really, really have to try to get them to, to bend or break. Mm. Now, for this, again, I use the Kitchy train. I did, I've got a substitute that I'll talk about later for that. Um, okay. For the racket mechanism on the, uh, the uh, for the ends here, basically, I take 
the Tichy to train uh, racket me mechan ratchet mechanism, and I cut it in two, and I sand them smooth. This one, uh, I actually sand them lower than this now. I simply take a uh, emery board and lay it um, on my workbench, take the ratchet mechanism, lay it on top, I wet my finger, and I drag it from one end to the other of that emery board 10 times. <laughs> then I take it and I reverse the ratchet, wet my finger again, and drag it another 10 times. And I do that and it gradually, evenly lowers these. And then if you use tester cement, it just, it melts in. And so the distances now are not that great. I do something similar with this end. Uh, so it's nice and flat and fits snugly underneath the car. Um, the holes for through the platform, again, they're the divider and centered and centered. Um, I actually, at this point in my career, have little um, shims so I can just put them uh, between what will be this brake staff and the car body so that the wheels, this hole here and this hole through the, are uh, the same distance and they're not sitting at an angle one way or another. DC, are you using a cursor to show us something on this picture? I'm sorry? Were you using your cursor to show yes. something? Yeah. Sure. Can, can you see my I'm not, cursor? I'm not seeing it. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, oh. It's really, really small. Can you make the, Is there a way to make it larger? That I don't know. It's okay. It's a, just keep, carry on. I didn't mean to okay. interrupt. I'll, oh, I wish I could. I thought about that. I'm not sure how to do that. Okay. So um, nowadays I replace the Titchy train brake wheel with actually ones from BTS, which are much, they don't have this obnoxious flat bottom. They actually look more to scale. And rather than the Titchy train brake staff, I actually use Titchy train uh, 0.015 phosphor bronze wire and uh, which gives me a thinner looking um, brake staff. So not only did I have problems with the Titchy train brake wheels, uh, if you handle the cars too much, I've actually had them brake by transporting them up to Tom's or during storage. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about grab bars. This happens to be um, uh, 18 inch Westerfield grab bar. And these are the same nut and bolt and washer castings that I used by Titchy Train that I used here. Um, I've made myself, I found it maybe a little bit cheaper to make your own grab bars and for different car models, I've had to make different ones. Can you see over here on the left side of the screen, the spray jig? This is actually a Grantline jig that made, uh, I think one's an 18 inch, I think the other's a 24 inch uh, grab bars. Uh, but I found that I needed other sizes and so I've made different jigs over the years. Uh, I made some here so I can bend the, uh, um, the railing for the ends of cars, okay? And then over here on the right hand in this little case here, um, I've got different pieces of, of HO scale three inch thin, thick styrene, our 0 .030 styrene. So I get consistent uh, spacing of my metal grab bars from the car body. Um, I read somewhere that it should be four inches and I tried that on a car build, I did. And I ended up ripping out those grab bars because they just looked too far away from the, the body. 
And so three inches, I, I would love to have like 3.5, but I don't think they make styrene that thick. If I'm wrong, somebody let me know. Okay. This is another jig I use. And this one is when you're putting the uh, grab bars on the roof of the cars. I use this jig. And you're looking at the side that actually sets on the car body itself. So if you look here on the right, this piece, think about it, think of it as you're drilling from the top down through the two the holes you see here. This rests against the end of the car, and this here rests, this piece here rests against the car side. Again, any time I drill the holes, drilling straight down through the jig, the grab bars are all spaced at the consistent uh, dimensions from the end and the side of the car. Okay. Uh, I, over the years, I've developed jigs as I found as I found need of them. Um, and I have quite a collection at this point. In fact, some I can't find anymore, and some I don't remember what they're for, so I've begun to label them. Um, the ladders, okay. Uh, to make, this is a jig I made to make styrene ladders with. Okay, I don't, don't do wood ladders, it's styrene ladders. Basically, it's, uh, I think it was a four by 12, and then I, I laid a four by 12 down, then put in a piece of, piece of HO scale two by three, then I laid a two by 12 down, and then I uh, laid another piece of HO scale two by three, and then another um, HO scale four by 12. And that was completely dry. I took and figured out what the dimensions were, and I cut holes down to the base wood here so that what I do is I lay a piece of 2 by 3 styrene in each of the edges, if you can see that. And then, as I do with everything else, I have HO scale 1 by 2s cut to just a little bit over and I glue them in here. Now, the trick is you don't overdo it with the glue. I use the Maya, um, the super thin stuff, and it does not, believe me, you can get glue, especially if you use tester cement, you can get styrene glued to wood where it won't want to come off, where you have to use like a chisel to get it off. I know that from experience. But if you use just a little bit of glue, you can gently pry it out. Then you get your ladder stock. This is enough to make it two ladders, okay? And then you can cut them to length to fit your car. Um, I'll talk more about that later. These are the doors that I used on that particular car. Um, See, and that, that, that. Um, there's the part number. These are actually a more modern door. And if I had to do it again, actually, I will have to do it again because I have about four or five more cars to convert. Um, I would use the original doors, but I would use a sanding plate to. Uh, to sand them thinner than the uh, the uh, castings that are supplied with the original car. Uh, all a sanding plate is basically, I have some like uh, uh, maybe eight or 10 by 12 pieces of uh, um, plate glass. And I put a piece of sandpaper there and I tape around the edges so they're nice and flat. And I use that to sand whatever I want to sand it, ladder. Um, I use the tape because I found that if I don't, sandpaper just has a nice natural tendency to curl up a little bit. And it doesn't uh, sand as even as, as I do if I use the sanding plate. 
Okay, so now we're turning to the car floor. The car body, once it's glued, you'll find that the original car board floor, of course, is too long and too wide. So I cut a section out of the center and then splice the right and left hand together. Uh, and because butt joints are inherently weak, I also glued on this piece of scrap styrene, uh, and I, which I subsequently painted wood color, which subsequently, when the car was done, you can't see inside the car to tell. So I could just have used a, painted a piece of uh, styrene black and put in there and wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Um, notice that I do remove the weights because otherwise the given weights are the car just weighs too much. Okay. This is my oops photo. Um, there's a couple old adages. One is uh, measure twice, cut once. Um, and the, the other one is that the um, difference between good modelers and great modelers is uh, great modelers know how to cover up their mistakes. So I was a little bit short but I was able to sand and glue in a splice of a styrene so that, uh, and that was before I glued this plate on, so that this from right end to left end here fits snugly in the car bottom. The bolster, um, or, I'm sorry, the truss rod beams are made of HO scale uh, six by six. The demand spacing is taken from the dimensions on the, uh, the model railroader magazine. Um, I cut them over long like everything else. And uh, I learned this trick from Wayne Weslowski. Cut it over long and then sand it flat to your final dimensions. And people think you're a great modeler when just you become a great at sanding things. Okay. The truss rod itself is made out of 10 pound nylon fishing wire. The uh, turnbuckles are, um, let's see. Let's see, they are uh, Ditchy Train 8021 turnbuckles. And the these are three inch queen posts and they are from Grantline, now San Juan models, and they are part 5052. How to do the truss rods, I learned from the first uh, um, roundhouse car kit I put together, and I just thread the fishing line through one hole, over the beam, through the uh, turnbuckle. Now, once the turnbuckles are cut from their uh, the the flashing, I run a number 80 drill bit through, which makes it a whole lot easier for me to thread the drill bits through, I mean, the, the fishing line through. And then I thread the line through this hole. The spacing between the Queen post is the same as the spacing between the holes on the original model. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes. I, I used to model bottoms of cars quite a bit, and uh, nobody ever really looks at the model of your car, and I'm not building cars for a contest. So I just... Um, I use those holes and that's where I got my spacing from. Um, but uh, you thread it through this hole, through this hole, up and over again, down through the hole on the left, over to the hole, uh, second hole on the third hole on the left, out and over here, here, here. And after you're done, then I glue the uh, fishing line into the fishing line to the car floor using super glue of your choice. 
When that's dry, then I begin going back and tightening up the truss rods. Now to get them so they're nice and taut and not saggy, rather than tighten them with the truss rod in the uh, queen post, I actually lay it to the side of the queen post. I get all the, uh, the tightening done. I super glue it from where I originally threaded it through, then I can cut the fishing line. Um, the original intent was to save fishing line. Um, I probably have enough fishing line at this point that um, somebody's going to have to figure out what to do with it after I die. <laughs> I find that there are enough in the BTS kits that I can usually get a couple of cars done out of the what what they just supply. Okay. After the uh, the uh, CA has dried, I then carefully take the truss rods and place them on top of the queen posts. And then again, using my divider, I uh, make sure that the spacing between the queen post and the side of the turnbuckle on each side is the same. I found I usually do that through trial and error. Um, probably would be easier if I just took a piece of metal and figured out what the dimension was going to be on all my cars and cut it to that width. Um, because there is a tendency for, if you're not careful, for the turnbuckles to slide to where you don't want them and stay there permanently. Um, I've gotten pretty good, so it's it's not too bad, but, but that's that's the way the bottom of the car looks. You'll note that the uh, uh, bolsters are too modern, and uh, but I decided not to mess with them on this car, and I used the original trucks. Eventually, I will replace them, but uh, for now, it's good enough. Um, going to do some comparison shots. The original car looked like the one on the lower, and up above it here is the initially finished car, uh, showing the end beam details. Now, this coupler that I used was actually, I don't use this style anymore. It was from Keyport Car and Foundry, and it was just a drop in for the uh, um, the, the uh, original uh, couplers. So I could just drop it in the pocket, put on the cap, and it's ready to go. Wow. Uh, yes. Um, this shows the difference in length. Um, let's see. Quick comment. Yes, sir. Um, you know, when you showed that your your uh, transformation car there at first, I thought you scratch built the doors, um, knowing you, but that's a pretty good casting for a molded piece, like because I thought you scratch built it. That is that is the, the uh, San Juan models rat, rat line. Right. Now this is actually a more mod from a more modern car, but I kind of I fell in love with it. But if I have to do it again, I would probably take the doors on the bottom, sand off these uh, door handles, and uh, sand it down as much as I can, and then put a put on square styrene around this. Right. Also note that uh, up here, when wow. I was done, this is an HO scale one by four. Just run along back there. You get a nice fit between your roof and your side. I also, uh, these windows you just are not prototypical. So I framed uh, these out with HO scale. I think they're one by twos. Wow. Okay. So uh, I also, since I sand, sanded off the uh, doorstop, I made door stops 
Now the door stops are made from, I don't have pictures of the process, unfortunately, but evergreen styrene, uh, HO scale 0.06 by 0.06 styrene. And I cut it to like a four inch width. And then onto that, can you see the centerpiece here? Does that make, yeah. oops, let's see if I can make that bigger. No. I don't know how to make this bigger. Is it's, there a way to make it bigger? Yeah, right click it. Just right click it and you might get an option to zoom. No, it doesn't give me that huh. on this one. Okay. Anyways, then I glue a piece of one inch thick styrene right there. And then I sand them at an angle like the prototype. And it looks pretty good when you're done. Uh, these uh, stirrup steps uh, probably come with that in a later slide, but they are, uh... oh shoot, I'll have to wait to that slide because I've got the number on it. Um, I don't have any pictures of the car prior to painting and I apologize for that. Truss rods look much more to scale. Get the turnbuckles here, like on the uh, US military railroad car. Um, you can see where I sanded these all off, flat off of there. Um, let's see. The, Next car. What's the, on the brake wheel height, is that supposed to be like at waist level or, what, or was there a standard? Is um, I'm seeing different heights. It's about two feet, this is my guesstimate. Hmm. Um, I would have to go back to the, the I originally, I, I did, Tom and I have learned over the years to write down what, uh, everything you do when you're building a car, including, you know, the wheels you use, the length of the axle, the color of paints. Um, I didn't do that back then. Um, I tried to take pictures of the process. But quite frankly, I continually to get so involved in the actual build that I forget to write things down or to take pictures of it. And that's unfortunately what I did here. Uh, uh, one of the things I used in this particular car that, um, that I no longer do is I uh, used uh, tissue paper, like wrapping tissue paper for a tar paper roof. And I would glue a, a piece completely across the top. And then I'd glue another piece cut so that the distance between the edge and the edge of the piece I'm gluing across the top was uh, HO scale about three feet. I would glue it down using super glue. Uh, which kind of works pretty good, except over the years in handling, you can see the white here and the white at the end of the car. Now, instead, I use styrene. I've got like a old coffee can. Uh, there's maybe a two pound can, not the big cans, but a smaller can. And I put a light bulb in there and I've got some heavy duty rubber bands that gives me a nice curve. And I glue on a piece of like, uh, for the initial one, a piece of two inch thick styrene that's spent. And for this one, a piece of like uh, one inch thick styrene, just plain styrene sheet. Once I paint it, I can, it looks great. Now, uh, I haven't mentioned the roof walks yet. The roof walks are made out of uh, two by six, uh, evergreen styrene. To make them, I uh, figured out what the width is, uh, leaving some space in between. The, uh, does anybody remember what the name's called here? That, that hold the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the moth, the car is made out of HO scale four by four. I would glue on the end pieces to ensure that everything was nice and square. And then they would space the uh, supports, break, yeah, 
Brookwalk supports uh, per the uh, model railroader diagram using my uh, scribe to determine the spacing. When that was all dry, I have a half round file that I was able to round where it sit, where the support sit against the car. Now, instead, I actually use a uh, Titchy train makes uh, um, brake flat roof walk supports. And I use those. And even though they're designed for a pre peak roof box car like this one on the left, uh, with just little sanding, they sit just, just fine. Um, let's see. One other thing I wanted to note in this, I don't know if you can tell here, but actually at the top of here, once it's on the car body glued on, I take and I've uh, sand the uh, just slight double in the car body. So it looks like the US military, I'm sorry, in the upper end of the ladders to res uh, resemble that on the US military railroad box car. Also, which doesn't show clear in the, si the slide, that there are little holes drilled in the uprights, which can mimic the uh, US military railroad boxcar ends in the drawing. Uh, side by side comparison. Uh, again, this is the prototype. And that was uh, the initially the initial one on a diorama I built. Uh, let's see what I said about that. I have notes here I had to write down. Um, um, it's interesting that here, um, the US military railroad box starts to go from not counting the end means, not counting the brakes, so from the end of the car, and end of the car to the other is 25 feet, nine inches. And uh, so is this one. So those cuts, to everything just came out just right on. That was serendipity. I was going for close enough. Serendipity, it came out uh, right enough. Uh, in this car, you can see up here, the brake wheel is much thinner brake wheel. Um, you can see some of the wear and tear of the edge of the car. You'll notice that the car changed from 26 to 36. Um, that's because I accidentally made a flat car, number dip to 26. It was easier to change the, the two to a three on this car than to try to do that one over. Uh, let's see. Da -da -da -da. Here's a three quarter view of the car today, showing if you look up here along the edge of the roof, well, I do not like that. Maybe prototypical for some cars. Um, but my line is profiting extensively from that peach industry and uh, Ward Woods shipping its connections with the Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. Uh, here you can probably tell a little bit better the bevel in the end. Um, also, I replaced the daub calipers with ones from uh, San Juan Models Grant Line. Um, it's the end view of the car. And these are the, mod, the number 147. Uh, the draw heads are a little bit big, so I tend to sand them down a little bit for a little bit smoother. But it's a drop in in those coupler pockets. Um, and uh, that's kind of it. Were there questions? Is anybody still awake? <laughs> Heck yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, did you, just wondering, don't go back and try. How did you, did, did you do grooving on the roof to show the paneling of the, um, the tinning? No, but you, you've, uh, you've made a good point here. Um, the roof is, uh, Oh, here. Nope, that's not it. Here. Okay. 
No, what I do on the roof, um, it would be a good idea to use scribe siding because it tends to the, the, the molding it into shape would be easier. Mm -hmm. However, not enough of it actually extends over the end of the car. What I didn't mention is that between these side pieces, I, I, I was used to be a real estate agent. And so what I did, I've got some, I stay, could stay with one company and they would keep, you know, companies get sold to other companies and the name changes. So you're working with company A and then company B buys company A and now you're not moving your office anything, but you're working for company B. So all those company A signs you have end up in the trash. I could not see all that good styling going to waste. So I uh, salvaged a number of the signs from the dumpster and I cut a piece that can fit just in here. I glue it so it comes to just the, the peak of the roof. Okay. After the glue is dry, I sand it to uh, so mm -hmm. the curve matches the curve on each end. And that's just sanding, sand a little, look a little, sand a little, look a little until it's done. Onto that, the styrene glues pretty easily. Again, to your point, Roger, if I use scribe siding, getting those bends to the, get the curve would be easier. Okay. okay. If I was going to show the inside of the car, that's what I would do. However, on any of the cars I'm building, I probably will not have the doors open and closing uh, simply because of the side bracing to give it strength. Um, I, 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 butt joints are just weak and I would have messed up the car somehow if I could just relied on butt joints. Right. And so I opted for the strength in that case. Mm-hmm. It's a choice. It's a, everything we do is a compromise. Yeah. And and uh, I'll leave it, leave it to the, the viewer to determine how uh, how accurately I came to the to trying to uh, capture the feel of the prototype mm -hmm. of the type eighteen sixties car. My layout's actually set in eighteen sixty four. So. Touchdown. Well oh, done. Thank you. I still think it looks fantastic. And now that I've got the backing of what you did with it, um, I, I mean, you completely reconfigured that car to the correct size. Um, well, the, the one thing it had that I did not feel, I still do not feel comfortable in doing is you look at the sides here, mm -hmm. getting, getting, getting that, those done and that done. And over here, you know, getting the vent work done. Um, yeah. That I, I just not feel comfortable doing. Now, I found some, some ventilated box cars, some pictures online of from later eras, like 1895. But if you look at the end of the car, I don't know, LeBron, you made a car where you had, it looks like ventilated ends almost. Yes, some of the car, some of those cars had ends that looked very similar to that. And the, those <laughs> I made, I took uh, out of some photographs from Atlanta. Right. Yeah. Uh, do you have any you could you could bring up and show to the group by any chance? No, I don't. There's all. Okay. Well, maybe maybe one of our net next meetings you could. Okay. Because I I think they look great. I actually LeBron told me how we did it and. That's something I'm looking forward to trying eventually. But as Tom says, I need to turn to uh, getting my track work <laughs> affixed to, to my affixed to the uh, the pink Pacific. Yes. <laughs> thing I was wondering on that first uh, the historical photo. Uh, for one, there's a sign on the middle left. You know what that sign is. And then also the buildings on the right. I'm used to thinking of coal chutes, but that didn't quite seem right. You know what the chutes are on the buildings on the right and the sign on the middle left? The sign on the middle left 
Yeah, the, the very it left hand side of the photo. Something house. So I'm not sure. Um, this was Wyoming, Delaware. Uh, I think this was 1895. You can't really tell the end of the car too well. But uh, if you're storing peaches, um, you're pro now this says they're unloading peaches. Because of the location of Wyoming, Delaware, what they're probably actually doing is taking these bushels of peaches and loading them onto the box cars. Okay. These would be warehouses in which the peaches were stored. Okay. Uh, again, the whole idea, the only reason that the industry flourished, again, it went, the industry went south, cash crop went south as the railroad was built south. But because you know, they does... were able to get the fresh fruit to the market in a timely manner. Do you know what those what what Walter was saying? What those things are that look like shoots? Are they just vents? That I do not know. The slide did not say. Okay. I I just found that slide yesterday. That image yesterday. And you or said that sign morning. has the name house on it. On the bottom it says house. Oh, and at the, at, the, at the top. You know, it would be something like there was a relay house. It was oh. probably some kind of like passenger thing. Got it. So oh. it's very interesting. I found out that the, the, this is from the Delaware Railroad, uh, which was built north. My railroad goes from the Delaware River. The goal is the Ohio River. The Delaware Rail Railroad was actually built from... Uh, Newcastle area in Delaware, south to a town on the Delaware Maryland border called Delmar. Wyoming's about the middle of the route. Mm. Okay. Uh, but the stations that I found, I found at least one station that was built in the 1860s in its brick. From, from looking at it, it looks pretty modern, but it's a brick station. I found other ones from the 1800s, late built, like 1868. Again, this railroad, brick, brick railroad station. They see. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, let me get out of here so you can see your, see the bronze. Okay, show us the bronze. See it. Yeah. Whoa, all the way up the side? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the uh, photograph shows. I love now, that car. Now, LeBron, can you hold your car up for one more minute? Okay. See how LeBron's uh, the vents are on either side? Now, in the cars, pictures I saw, the opening's actually in the center. And so the doors were like, okay, that's good enough. The doors were like on the side of the ventilated box car, so you could put the ventilated door. The, you know, the door with the ventilators on it oh, there, or you can slide it to the slide side and put the uh, the solid door on there. Hmm. Does that make sense? And so the, the, this was a very versatile box car that you could use it during the peach harvest, um, but also the rest of the year if you had something that needed transported that didn't need ventilation. You just had a regular box car you could use. And if there's freezing trouble, then the solid door might help things not to freeze inside. Okay. Well, this was uh, still, you know, it was a, uh, uh, the, the, the heyday of the peach harvest is in August in Delaware. Again, Middletown, Delaware has a peach festival, a big parade, you know, they close down the streets. Um, you can get all the peach preserves and peach pie you wanted at great prices. You can eat peaches till you're sick. Um, and uh, Delaware was known as the uh, the peach state at one time. That has since, since that title has since since been relinquished, as uh, LeBron can attest to. Yes, we are now the peach state. Then we were known as the Empire State. You're the Empire State? During the uh, 1860s. Okay, not New York. 
we refer to it as Empire State is in all the documents. Cool. So it's a session that says the Empire State is now free. Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So uh, we can run ventilated boxcars on our, our layouts, whether you want to go with an arched roof like I did, or you want to have a peaked roof, you could go either route. I would love to see what some other people have worked out. Bernie used to make a, a ventilated boxcar for our era. I have some of those kits down in my to-do box. I, I'm not, one of them. I think they're a little bigger than what I ended up building. Just a little bit. Yeah. But they're from the photos I actually I do have one. It's downstairs in storage. Uh, I got one of Al's cars that he did for the ONA Railroad. One of those. It makes a nice car. It makes a very nice car. And it has the double doors. I... Okay. Too bad, Bernie. I think Bernie might have some, some miscellaneous car parts, but nothing to build a complete car out of at this point. No. Now, when did uh, ventilators, ventilator cars uh, stop being used? And what was the next, I guess, generation of what they would use afterwards? Uh, ice cars? Probably. I would suspect. I mean, they were using ventilated cars 1895, 1900s. Um, may have been about the 1920s. I, I, again, that the modern era is not something I'm used to. <laughs> <laughs> Paul might know more, or some of the other guys might know more about more modern eras. Now, uh, no, seeing that you took the car pretty much completely apart and then reassembled it, would it, uh, uh, except for the part that you said you can't really do the ventilators, would it be more advantageous to just scratch build the car instead of hacking the car up and then putting it back, you know, pre um, you make it into yeah, I, I have scratch built box cars, and I found those after I scratch built my first box car out of styrene, which is that white car you saw. Okay, those, those that was a scratch built car that I made. I ran into Bill down at Kennesaw, Georgia. During uh, Kennesaw, it was in 2004. About a year later, he sent me a kit to uh, to see how I liked it. And Bill's cars are just so good. I've not built another scratch build another box car. My my issue again for me personally is the, the vents on the side, and I um have not been happy. I at one time I contemplated modeling surface cars and I tried modeling uh doors with bars on them, even our, our circus wagons with the bars on them. And I was very unhappy with my results. Let me say it, just say that. And so that is why I went to this route. And at this point I have a number of the cars and um if I do another another few, I'd be happy as uh, time allows. So it'll be more of an option of if you, depending on how well your skills are to scratch build it or go the route that you just did. Correct. You could also scratch build it out of, out of wood. I happened to use styrene at that time. Um, as I kind of went over, you can actually, I glued styrene brake platforms and ladders onto wood car ends and it works just great then i'll go back with just a little drop of super glue after the you know like the next day and uh but the uh like the tester cement melts the styrene just enough so it actually uh melts goes into the grooves of the wood and helps adhere it. Yeah. Mm. Great work, man. Jeez. Thank Meticulousness. You.
Yeah, DC, the next presentation needs to be how to make jigs. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Jigs are as, come uh, come as on, on an as needed basis. Right. One thing I have learned though is to label them and not just stick them in a box. Yeah, I've got a box that's not labeled. <laughs> oh man, it's just like, what was this for? Yeah. But I, yeah. I found found there's also no standard uh, grab rail length. Though I do like the 18 inch length. Generally speaking, to me, the 24 inch length's too long. Uh, I use like eight inch lengths uh, for uh, like door handles, and I even did a uh, Bram models over on Shapeways makes a B&O uh, iron box car. And I actually bent a piece of uh, uh, this 0 0.0150 wire into the curve. So it works on that being a box car. And I made two of those cars. And I probably won't do any more in my lifetime. Try, I'm trying to give the, that, that bent and do a curve and get the right diameter and everything. Was uh, tedious. Uh, well, we'll say challenging at least. Mm. Yeah, most of my grab irons and whatnot, I just use brass wire and brass wire. Titchy Train and uh, Westerfield make great 18 inch grab wires. I do not use the B grab wires supplied with BTS kits because I noticed that either end is flat and just it's not prototypical. It's like whatever bill holds them in to bend the grab bar makes a nice corner, but it ends up with this flat space. Hmm. And um, I've noticed that on so many of the car kits that I just put them in a, to the side or put them in a, in a container when I just need a sort of short section of brass wire to use. I like the others better. Personal preference. All right. Good. Good. All right. Thank you, brother. That was very good. Thanks. Excellent, DC. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Thank Great you. work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that was uh, fun. Thanks. Now, if the, the presentation is over, I could uh, give you a quick, uh, well, at least on PC, uh, uh, show you how to change the size of the mouse cursor so you can actually see it if you want Good. me to share. Okay. What do you need yeah. me to do? Uh, Are you, you sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Okay. okay. So you go uh, basically go to settings and it says ease of access. I'm assuming Mac has for something. Okay. Very uh, and it says. Uh, Change the pointer size and color, so you can change. Oh the size. wow! Okay. You really, not if you really want to. Uh, also, what I've been keeping mine around too, but after looking at this, it might go up to three. But you could also change the pointer color, and Love you can it. go. And so, uh, because that'll turn around and make it so you you won't get confused with a uh, uh, the the quote quote unquote standard color. Sometimes I know that in the presentations, as I've watched them, someone's been moving their cursor, and I've been thought I was moving my cursor. Exactly. <laughs> so, if you change, so if you change the size and the color, you know, go purple, blue, cyan, whatever you want, and all that, and then uh, uh, it won't get confused with the the standard color. Excellent. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, whoever, uh, you know, now that's recorded, you could actually have this as a, you know, for future presenta future presenters that haven't seen this. Uh, but you also uh, maybe find somebody with a Mac that could probably t uh, show how to change the settings on a Mac. So I'm because uh, I think if I remember correctly, the, the ease of access is for people who will have low vision. So they have to have the massive, uh, not only the massive cursor, 
but also uh, massive font size and everything so they can uh, read it. Hey, Charlie, so you want to do a little presentation on the next Zoom about how to do it on the Mac? I can, I can tell you how to do it on Mac. Okay, Paul. You open up the control panel, you will find a setting for appearance. If you select, I'm sorry, a setting for accessibility. If you select display down below a little ways on the display, you can change the pointer size and it's outlined in fill color. Fantastic. <laughs> so you got that, Charlie? Control panel, accessibility, display. I'm, ta I'm taking notes. I'm <laughs> I, I actually I think that's a, that that is one of the most important points of this whole evening is because as we're talking to each other to have that larger cursor and in a different color you know so it stands out from whatever we're talking about would be an aid to everybody I have a, a relatively large screen that I look at and it's still small for me I can imagine if you're using a laptop or a, an iPad or something like Roger's using. Yeah. Yeah. You know? or, or, or if you're using a phone, I mean, it's like if you're using yeah. just a phone and all that, you know, you're, you're not going to see that small little itty bitty cursor. So maybe having it, a, try to make it a habit, a habit of having a presenter to, you know, <clears> hey, can you make the cursor much larger? Uh, and yeah, that color might be an optional, but because you know some people are colorblind, so they might not see uh -huh. whatever changed it. So I don't know. Yeah, but it does make it so you're you don't confuse. <laughs> it does make it so you don't confuse your cursor with with the the default cursor. I mean, if somebody turns around and just happens to pick the same size and color of your cursor, well, you're back to square one. Right. Good tip. Thank you, Paul. And yeah. and on that. Hey, hey, Tom, can you mm. go over and tell us about your uh, your nameplates? Oh, uh, <clears throat> what do you got, Charlie? No, uh, nameplates like for cities or? Oh, no, this is. Um, oh, for the locomotives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will do a quickie on this. So there's the name board or name plate, whatever you want to call it, that comes on these guys. And I, two things. One, it's the same name, of course, all the time. And I wanted to change it, but I made larger letters because fellas that are operating the trains couldn't read the names on the locomotives. So, okay, here we go. <coughs> First thing I did was decided, you know, what names I want. And I have a, about five of these uh, that are printed out and I would indicate the size of the font and I would just go through and play with different fonts and background colors and what have you until I got what I wanted. So started with the styrene to build a box. And these are about eight points or nine points on the uh, <laughs> font size. And there it is right there. It shows you the, you know, the sizes that you need. And then I cut the box, the, the, uh, the back part of the, the name board based on the size that I print out. So I don't, I don't build these until I print out the names and then apply it onto the styrene and cut it up. I love this stuff. I probably told you about it in the past, Bondine, and uh, it's great for any kind of styrene to any. So you don't. It does. It could be evergreen and, and plastruck, and it'll still work. It is great stuff. Yep. Uh, let's see. And I chose this color, the brass. I I I paint the inside. Because once the once your decal or, or name is in there, you don't want to be painting around it because it'll eventually wick into the paper itself. So I painted those first, and I leave a little tab on the end so that I can maneuver it until I'm ready to install it on the locomotive. And I use this glue stick to adhere the the name onto the 
back of the, the name board. And that works great. I was wondering how that was going to play out, but it worked out great. Tom, is that just paper? Is the name just paper? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like all of these. They're yeah. just printed out right on the right on paper. Just okay. straight have, have, have you tried printing it on the gal paper or anything like that? No, I have not. No. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I haven't found a need to do that because this works pretty easy. It takes a few steps mm -hmm. out of the process. Okay. Uh, so there's that. And then she is installed. Uh, this locomotive was named, this is its third rendition. The first, it was uh, out, built by Rhett Tyler for me. Uh, we're going back, Jesus, a boatload of years. And it was the number 59. And I didn't want it to be a US military locomotive anymore. So I, I named it the Tennessee, which was a, uh, I believe it was, an Atlanta West Point or a Georgia Railroad name. So I changed the decals for the tender on that. And then I realized I need more WNA locomotives. So I converted it once more. And evidently there was a New Jersey on the roster for the WNA, which was, I think, I can't pass that up. <laughs> and here it all, here it is. It's just pretty much it. And all I do is I use just a very little either um, what do you call it? Uh, super glue or i will use aileen's tacky glue because i never know when i want to maybe take it off and put a different name on there <laughs> yep. mm. <laughs> so that's how i do my name boards i've done them all that way mm. and then uh, of course there's the new one called the mazipa or the mazepa i don't know if lebron ever heard of that but that was on the wna and the quick story on that one is uh, there was a famous Ukrainian general back in the 17th or 18th century. And uh, I think it was Lloyd Byron that wrote a poem about him. And it became a play. And one of the traumatizing things about the play was uh, the general was captured and he was put naked, strapped back down on the horse and they just sent the horse off and that's and they tied him down so i don't know it was just like a torture thing and when that got to be kind kind of popular somebody had the idea to beef it up so to speak a little bit and instead of a man in the role of the colonel Mazepa, they put a woman that was dressed in some kind of like flesh clothing supposedly and they would yet yeah, there's a marquee that shows a woman on on a horse with her back strapped down to the horse as part of the play. And of course, a woman versus a man drew a lot more attention and they made a boatload of money on that show. <laughs> so that's the that's the birth of Mazepa. Crazy. I, I, as many times as I've looked through that roster, I never saw that word. And, and I was going through, I said, let me pick out a name that LeBron doesn't have. <laughs> Mazepa, he doesn't have that. And I thought, what the hell is Mazepa? <laughs> I've heard that story from somewhere. John Ott, probably. Yeah. Yeah, because he's the one that educated me on the fact that they uh, put a woman in that role. And he sent me an image of the uh, uh, the poster with her. So I'm going to make sure I, I make one of those and stick it on the car shed for uh, upcoming upcoming. Yes. On yeah. that tender, I saw the water fill in the back, but what are those two square things in the front? God damn. It's like some kind of grates or something. First, I was thinking a pile of bricks, but that didn't make any These sense. These two back here? Yeah, yeah. Toolboxes. Ah, okay. With a yeah. slant top, right, Tom? They're yeah. not, not peak. They're, it's a slant top. That's right. Those are from uh, Precision Scale. Oh. Been looking and for like that i mean the detail that Rhett goes into it's like he does these things with these uh stanchions and then he puts all of this piping in here and he wrapped it and went out. i mean he he gets crazy with his super detailing he's a fantastic modeler i think some of you guys mm -hmm. have not most of you have seen his work um that was my that was my first general and i everything i've built was mostly from what I learned from Al and 
picked up from Rhett. And now we have eight locomotives running on the WNA North branch. And I've been having so much fun programming different whistles and bells and speeds. And oh my God, it's like, it's candy land when you get into the programming. Ah, you know, that's, that's the icing on the cake. All right, gentlemen, any, any other comments or questions? Does, uh, does anyone know of anyone that makes uh, four-wheeled boxcars? European? American. There's a museum up in Connecticut that actually has some examples of them. Maybe it's the trolley museum up there. Okay. I don't know. I don't know of anybody who makes any uh, models. Well, uh, you know, the reason why I ask because, well, I do know of one that makes a uh, uh, HO scale models. It's a uh, called Congoino Models. Uh, basically, what they did was they uh, got a hold of the uh, the Faber Caboose uh, truck. Yeah. And that's why uh, th th I made this one as built because it has the toolboxes underneath. But the second one I built, I actually took the, uh, I actually took the the box uh, the box toolboxes off, so it looks a little bit more like an actual uh, pro box proper. Box. So this one I'm th this one I'm th thinking about making as a maintenance way because toolboxes would make sense on a yeah. A uh, vehicle, but uh, it's Congoino models. Um, the guy who uh, uh, he he also does uh, uh, he also does uh, smaller, regular, normal box cars. Uh, actually, he started out with flat cars, and uh, he had a thirty-six foot one. And I went and I asked him one time. I said, "Do you plan on making the twenty? You know." Taking the twenty-five foot box car and turning that into a box car, and he's like, "Well, I was planning on it, but I didn't know if anybody wanted it." And I'm like, "I'm one, you know." So, uh, but uh, uh, but he does. Uh, it, it's he he does say that uh, these are not actually the these are not on an actual prototype, but he right. uses he uses a lot of the common stuff that. Uh, uh that would be normally used uh one thing he, that i that i've modified where he doesn't do is that he doesn't really have brakes for it but i wanted wound up taking what uh uh the brake rod is actually a pin that he uses to actually help uh get uh open up the holes you know for the uh nut vault washer castings and all that mm. and on the flat car he uses that pin to make the brake wheel for it. So right. I did the same thing, uh, but I wound up uh, adding a piece of uh, piece of uh, wood, which is actually in between the uh, the frame uh, the frame, and uh, <clears throat> we made the the pin longer so it would sort of kind of look like a, an extended uh, brake wheel. Nice so, work. Hey, thank you. You now, now you, you said Charlie? that Charlie. Uh, he uh, does he make a complete kit or just parts that you could take and put on a Bachman barber? It's a uh, it's a complete kit. It's about twenty five dollars. <throat> Is it three D printed or uh, laser cut? Oh, okay. And. Uh, uh, hold on one second. Let me. I think Charlie was going to say something. You have a question, Charlie? But you know, in the past year or so, we were talking about the makeup of an artillery train. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, it was based on that that one description uh, where they use four wheel flat cars or, or 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 gondolas. You know, just had two axles. And then somebody in the group, I don't know if it was LeBron or John Ott or whatever, just pulled up this picture of four-wheel flat cars uh, in the U.S. Uh, I always thought that would be fun to, to make that along those lines that uh, Edward's talking about. 
Do you know what line it was, that photo? No, uh, but somebody, you know, during the discussion, somebody, or uh, maybe it was Don Ball. Maybe he, he had a picture of, uh, you remember that? The, I do. It was Don. You're right. Yeah, You're right. Okay. And I, I, I probably took a picture of it on the screen because I was so fascinated. I'll try to find that for next time. Uh, okay. Sure. Good. All right. Well, gentlemen, I threw in the 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 website, the link. the link in the chat. So if anyone wants to have four a four wheel box car, thanks. Yeah, he's he's been at, at a couple of train shows down in down in Demonium, and uh, he was at, he was actually up at uh, what's the one he went up to in New England, Tom Amherst. Amherst, yeah, yeah, yeah Springfield. Cool. Yeah, I met cool. him through uh, New Tracks Modeling. He uh, he does the uh, the my build uh, series where somebody goes and says, "Hey, I did this," and wants to show it off, and goes that way. Tom, Good. Tom, who are, who are the characters in your background? <laughs> Nefarious. The guy with the big mustache, that's Christopher Eldridge. He's the one that built my backdrops. Uh, I go back, got over 40 years with him. And uh, he also built a few extraordinary structures on the layout. Uh, unfortunately, back in December, he passed away. Um, and then there's Brian, camera, between me and DC. Yes. My backdrop guru. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tom, to hear about Chris. Oh man, I, that's that's yeah. I can't even get into that. I I, I get all messed up. Yeah. But uh, it's a good memory. He's on the he's on the wall of fame here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, gentlemen, I'm going to call it uh, an evening, and I want to send out my thanks for DC and the meticulous work he does, and shows cool. us uh, you know what's possible with a little bit of patience, and. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. Not sure. I think Roger's doing a layout update, right? Oh no, that's LeBron. Oh no, that's uh... <laughs> uh, 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 uh. it's Vince. That's right, Vince. I'm sorry. Sure. Vince. Right, right, right. No, good. All right. Well, well, we'll have something for you as always. Have a great rest of your week, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Good night, now, guys. Good night.